By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have magic for you from Germany, from the Urborg Forest Frenzy, the old school tournament held in Germany, Dusseldorf. And uh, we are actually at the quarterfinals now. And in this quarterfinals, we're gonna, going to see a very interesting match. Two absolute top decks uh, going to face off against each other. We've got Jordi from Spain. He's playing with a Robots Brew and he's added white into the mix. So it's quite interesting. And he's taking on Avert and Avert is playing with the deck that I've called Savannah Bolts. And uh, man, it's looking really, really strong. It's white, it's red, it's blue. Now, before I go into the deck decks, I've got beautiful deck picks of both of these decks. I would just like to point out that as always, you can skip this section as well. I know that some people enjoy going to the games straight away. You can do that very simply by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those reads MTG games. Click on there, that will take you straight to the action. Maybe it's also nice to know that you can find more information about the rule set of this tournament in the description below as well. So if those are things that you want to know, you know, check out the description, it's got most of the information. And if you still have any questions about the game, about the video, about the tournament, feel free to, um, to post your questions in the comments below. And don't forget, man, leave a like, it really helps. Okay, and then now we are going to continue with the deck deck. I'm actually gonna start with the robots deck of Jordi. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Jordi. So it's obvious this is a robots deck. Now for people not familiar with the term robots, um, you call something a robots deck when there are a lot of artifact creatures in the deck and they are like the robots. So here you see Triskelion, which is really like a robot drawing by itself. I just love the art. It's so, um, how do you say it? It's kind of comical, isn't it? Um, and then you've got Suchi, completely different art, but also a robot, right? An artifact creature. So two play sets of that. And then it kind of gets interesting for me because I see three Sarah Angels where maybe I would expect to see a Tetravus. And if we look at the sideboard, we do see the uh, three Tetravuses in his sideboard, but he's chosen to go with the Sarah Angel in the main. And that way it kind of makes sense, right? Suchi is a four drop, Sarah is a five drop, and Trike is a six drop. So that kind of aligns nicely together. And then we also see the Icy Manipulators next to that. Obviously a very strong control card for as well. And talking about control, I think, you know, the choice in robots to go with white instead of red makes your deck a little bit more control because white is, you know, one of the control colors because it's so good in answering threats. You've got Disenchant, you've got Swords to Plows here. No balance in the main, another interesting choice. So balance here is moved to the sideboard. Always find it interesting because balance is such a strong card when you're behind, but I'm sure Jordi uh, thought about it when making that decision. So maybe if you're listening to the video, let me know why you've decided to put that into your sideboard. Um, so yeah, what I said, White gives you some more control elements. The Sarah Angels give flying ability to his deck, which is quite nice. Sarah Angel, of course, a very strong card, two white and three for a four, four flyer that doesn't need to tap when it attacks. And then when we're looking at the other cards, I think a really key card in any robots deck is to copy artifact. Copy artifact is just an insanely strong card, right? One blue and one to copy any artifact. So if you're interested in robots decks, what you're gonna look at is, okay, when is he gonna play the trike? How often can he copy the trike? And is he winning with the trike? Because the Triskelion is really, the key of any robots deck, right? Six to cast, card from the Antiquities expansion. It's a one, one, but it comes into play with three plus one plus one counters. And those plus one plus one counters, you can take off and you can shoot your opponent. You can shoot any creature you want. And each counter is one damage. Now this may not sound like much, but trust me, this card is so flexible. It's so strong. It's absolutely bonkers. It's really a great card in old school. And once it hits the board and as your opponent, you can't really, if you wait too long with doing anything about it, he's gonna start copying them. There will be more Triskelions. And the thing is with trikes, imagine you've got two 4-4 four, four trikes on the board. You attack your opponent for eight damage, right? But after your attack, you can simply take the counters off, off and deal an extra six damage. So that means you've got a potential of 14 damage on the board when you just have two trikes on your battlefield. Just think about that. That is kind of insane. We also see animate deaths, by the way, and that is really cool because Triskelion is one of the only creatures that can actually kill itself. So I've seen this numerous times. Your opponent wants to play, let's say, a Swords to Plowshares on the Triskelion. You don't want your Triskelion to be exiled. You don't want that to happen. So what you're going to do is you're going to take two counters off, deal two damage to your opponent, and then you're going to leave that one last counter on for the trike to kill itself. That way it's going to go to the graveyard 
and the sword fizzles, right? So the sword goes into the graveyard, your trike goes into the graveyard, and then you can use your anime dead to get it back. And we do see two anime deads in this deck. Now I think the rest of the cards are pretty much self-explanatory, right? We see the full power nine, we see some of the usual restricted cards, right? Demonic Tutor, Mind Twist, that stuff. We see the Moxon to Accelerate, uh, we see a beautiful Black Lotus. So that's all pretty much what we can expect of this deck. This is really a strong deck and I'm not surprised to see this in the top eight. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what Avert is playing and how he's going to battle this robust brute. So let's take a look at the deck of Avert Savannah Bolt. And here we see the deck of Avert. Now I've called it Savannah Bolt. I'm not sure Avert if you gave it a name. So I kind of just made up one. The reason I, I called it Savannah Bolt is pretty much when I'm looking at the top of your deck, I see a full play set of Savannah Lines <laughs> and, I, and I see a full play set of Lightning Bolts. And I know that um, Avert, his favorite card, I think, one of his favorite cards is Lightning Bolt. He loves the card and rightfully so. It's extremely versatile, one red, instant speed, three damage to any target. It's insane, right? And then the interesting thing here is that you're playing with white because I know that usually you don't play with white. It's your least favorite color. Um, but I understand that you wanted to try it out and kind of step into the white zone. And then I see four Savannah Lines. And I think kind of Savannah Lines and the Lightning Bolt kind of is also um, shows how you need to play this deck, like the idea of this deck. Like you, what you want to do is you don't want to spend a lot of resources on casting creatures you want to make sure that you have a lot of tricks up. So we see a lot of instant speed interrupts uh, spells in this deck, right? We've got disenchants, we've got swords, we've got counter spells, we've got mana drain, we've got side blast, we've got the bolts. So there's just a lot of instant speed. We've got the divine offering. There's a lot of stuff going on here that you can actually do in your opponent's turn. You don't have to do as much in your own turn. And that's where Savannah Lines is just a great creature because it's only one wide to drop. So you can do it early and aggressively. But also when you draw it later and you're kind of in that control mode where you're trying to keep the board as clean as possible, you can also just and play your lines and still keep counter magic up, keep disenchants up, you know, keep all those options open. And I think that's something, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, Avert, uh, but I think that's something that you like to do. I think that's part of your play style. Looking at the rest of the deck, uh, we see four Suchis, we see two Sarah Angels. So there is some beef in this deck as well. And what I also like is there are a lot of one-offs in this deck, right? We see one Atok, one Copy Artifact. Obviously all the power is a one-off, right? Because you're not allowed to play with more than one, but also one Disintegrate, one Psy Blast. Um, so why would you go for so many one-offs? Well, the interesting thing about a one-off is it makes your deck versatile, right? Let's say Avert plays the Atok pretty early in the game in game one. Then the opponent, in this case Jordi, is probably gonna think, oh, he's, he's playing some kind of ADOC brew. I need to think about that. And he's gonna sideboard, keeping that ATOC in mind, and which is actually not the case. As we can see now at his deck photo, his deck is not about the ATOC at all. I mean, sure, ATOC is still a strong creature when you're playing with Moxon, <laughs> you know, because I mean, ATOC loves to eat jewelry, but it's the deck doesn't revolve around the ATOC. And that's exactly what usually happens when you're playing one off. So, or you play it early in the game and your opponent gets a completely different, distorted view of what you actually want to do with your deck. Or this is another scenario. You play it later in the game and all of a sudden there's like, where did that ATOC come from? And you swing it and you kill him with the ATOC. I mean, remember ATOC has this potential, uh, you know, if you if the board's clear and you've got enough artifacts, you can basically kill your opponent with one swing, you know, because when we look at this deck, there are quite a lot of artifacts in here that he can sack to the ATOC, you know, and also need be, you can even sack, sack your mistress factories to the ATOC. Another thing that I kind of like, but that you usually don't see as often, because I guess it's just not that good, but that is to sack your Suchi during the main phase to your ATOC. So you can use that four mana to do something else. For example, make your disintegrate bigger. So in theory, for uh, you could swing in during combat with your uh, with your Suchi, and then in your second main, you sack your Suchi to the ATOC and you use that four extra mana to make your disintegrate four mana bigger. And maybe that's just the damage you need to kill your opponent, right? So that those are always little, little synergies that I like. Okay, so this is the deck of Avert. We've looked at the deck of, of Jordi. Both decks seem, oh, they seem pretty strong. So not surprised to see this in the top eight here in Dusseldorf. Now let's go to the games and let's see who's going to win this one. Let's go. Game number one, there we see the fist bumps. We're in the top eight of the Urborg Forest Frenzy. Who's gonna make it to the semifinals? 
Is it going to be Jordi from Spain sitting on the left with the trike playmat? Or is it Avert, the reigning champion, sitting on the right with the Dutch old school playmat there, playing a volcanic island, having quite a good start here with that Mox Emerald. There we see a Savannah from Jordi and playing into a Sol Ring and a Flower Stone. So that's some nice ramp up. He's even going to do more this turn, playing a Demonic Tutor. I wonder what he's going to look up. Only one generic left. I mean, it depends. It could be a Mind Twist. It could be an Ancestral Recall or maybe something completely different. And there he's uh, putting his cards back and Avert is going to take his turn. Now he's got four with that Mox Pearl. Looks like he doesn't have a land drop. I do think I see a Divine Offering in hand there. Could play that, of course, on the Soul Ring. That's exactly what he does. That means one life here, attacking for two as well with the uh, Mistress Factory. It's always nice when your opponent is tapped out because you kind of know I can now attack with the Factory. Yeah, there's the Mind Twist. Mind Twist for three. And four cards, so he can keep one. And there's Sarah Angel, I think a Bolt and a Disenchant gone. Really good Mind Twist because he could have played the Sarah now. Instead, he's going to play an Icy Manipulator. He's not going to tap anything down. Okay, he changes his mind. Yeah, I thought you probably want to tap something down in the upkeep of land. Because five mana can make a difference. Remember, uh, Yordi is playing with Sarah Angels as well. And let's look at his hand. We see an Animate Dead there. And he's going to play his Chaos Orb on the Icy Manipulator. That is a hit. Icy's gone. Very good flip. We also saw that Animate. But he doesn't have anything in the yard, I think. Although his opponent, I believe, has a Sarah Angel. So he could use that anime dead to get the Sarah Angel. Or, of course, play his own. So there is a Sarah Angel. And it's tough for Avert because of that Mind Twist that has really set him back. So he's going to take four. Going to drop to 17. Play a Suchi. Even more threats on the board. There we see a Divine Offering. And that's a nice thing about Divine Offering, by the way. It gives you life equal to the casting cost of the artifact you destroy. So in this case, and Avery gains four life, and he destroys the Suchi, and four life is basically an extra turn, right? And there we see anime dead. Interesting, I think I would have gone for the Sarah Angel, which I believe is in the bin of Avert, and that would have given him an, a flyer, and now he's got a, a three, four ground creature instead of a flyer, but still, he's gonna do, deal seven damage. Things are looking really good for Yordi here. There we see a Savannah Alliance, at least he can use this as a chump block if he wants to exactly soak up three points of damage. He's going to drop to eight here. He's going to play another Lions. Again, he can soak up some damage. And Yordi here untapping, attacking again and taking four more. He's on four measly life. He needs a balance. Balance would be good. No, that's it. Game numero uno goes to our Spanish friend Yordi. Well done. Felicidas, felicitat, although we have to wait, of course, this is just the first game, and now both players are going to jump into their sideboards, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Who's going to advance to the semifinals? Jordi just needs one more game, and then he's there, but look at that opener by Avert, a library of Alexandria. That is pretty brutal. And there we see Yordi just playing a single land to Tundra. So he's going to go up to seven, draw a card. Now he's going to drop his land. Probably that Sol Ring looks really nice. He's got seven in hand, tapping the city, taking a damage. Now he's got six in hand, playing the Sol Ring. He's going to go to 19. And there we see an underground sea with some cool altars. And he's going to draw extra cards again. Ah, this is, it's so brutal when you're playing against Library of Alexandria. You, you're really hoping that you get to draw into one of your answers to the land because... I mean, if Aver's going to keep up drawing extra cards, this is not going to end well for Yordi. Let's see what he can do here. Finding another duel, the Savannah. Tapping two, there's Chaos Orb. Okay, this is good. I think if I was him, I think I would activate it, but there are chances, of course, that Aver has or Disenchant or Divine Offering in hand, so maybe... Jordi's trying to be patient, waiting for him to tap out and then activate the Chaos Orb. This is just so brutal. Remember, in response to activation of the Chaos Orb, you can actually, yeah, he's going to attack here. You can actually play a Divine Offering or a Disenchant to destroy the Chaos Orb. And there is Swords. Now, are we going to see a Disenchant on the Chaos Orb? 
Yes, exactly. Okay, divine offering. It's kind of the same idea. So he's gaining even more life. This is kind of the problem for uh, Jordy here. He knew this. I mean, your opponent has so many cards in hand. You know that if you activate the Chaos Orb, he's going to respond by playing Disenchant. But if he plays Disenchant before, then you can respond by activating the Chaos Orb. So it's really this, this game of timing the right way. And there we saw that Brain Geyser, by the way, being Red Elemental Blasted by Avert. And it's looking really good for Avert. It looks like he's got full control. I'm not sure how many cards he's got in hand yet. He's not playing anything. So I think perhaps he's got six or something. It's kind of hard to see. He wants to keep that Loa active, of course. So decided not to play anything. Here we see an Icy Manipulator. And now he's probably going to tap the Loa exactly because he cannot activate it yet because he doesn't have enough cards. So now I believe he's got seven in hand. Playing Tundra. Interesting. Oh yeah, Divine Offering. And that Artifact Removal is really doing well here for, uh, for Avert. He's probably boarded in more after, uh, after Sideboard. And those Divine Offerings here, you can really see how strong they are. They're just Look at the life total of Avert, you know. It's so high up. And there we see another Icy Manipulator. And oh, Mana Drain. Wow, that means he's going to get four mana and he's kind of off the Library of Alexandria plan, I believe. If he can like find maybe Ancestral Recall or Brain Geyser or of course the Wheel of Fortune, he can get his Loa active again. Doesn't have, oh, he does have a red source with City of Brass. He's got, he's got mana floating now from the mana drain. He's going to use that to cast a Suchi. And will we see Sarah Angel here as well? There's a Sarah Angel. Yeah, he's just going for the full offensive here, which I think is a good decision. He's already drawn enough cards, and now he just needs to, you know, put some damage on the board and start attacking Yordi here. There we see a sword, so even more life. Just insane. Look at that life total. He's on 29 right now. Probably wishing he had a Sylvan. Usually he plays with Sylvan Library. There we see Disenchant. Suchi's gone. So Yordi's doing a pretty good job with kind of annihilating the threats. And maybe Avert's going to decide that he wants to build up his hand again. Although it looks like he wants to play out something. Going through the motion. What does he need to do here? Playing out a land Tundra. Tapping five. And there's Sarah Angel. So probably you wanted to play out this Tundra so you can still have counter magic up. So he has a two blue open. So there's that Sarah Angel. And is the Sarah going to stick? I mean, Jordy, yeah, has to pass only two cards in hand. On the other hand, perhaps it's just a sword so he can play that instant. It's going to take damage on 16. And it finally looks like Avert's gotten some control back here. Soul Ring. Attack again. Jordy going to drop to 12. I mean, Jordy needs something here. He needs something powerful to kind of swing this game back. Just has to pass. And this is a perfect scenario for Avert because and he's dealing damage and he's building up his cards in hand. That means that Loa is going to get active soon. Ooh, what is he going to play out? It's got to be pretty good. There we see an Atok. Okay, there's that one of Atok I talked about in the deck deck. And look at all the jewelry. That Atok's actually pretty big. And with the Atok and Sarah, he can win it next turn. Jordy has to do something here. Disenchant. Oh, it's not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> So that means it's 1-1. One, one. So we're going to go into game number three. The excitement! Game number three. Here we go. 1-1. One, one. And we see a, ooh, a mulligan here. Putting one card on the bottom here for Avert. There we see a Tundra by Jordy. And there is a Tundra as well. And a Mox Pearl. Ooh, an Ancestral Recall. That is so nice. Like if you've taken a mulligan and you find an Ancestral Recall in your new hand... You're like, bingo! <laughs> Crazy. And there is a Volcanic Island, Mox Emerald. There is the Felwer Stone. So also some ramping here from Jordy. What can he do here? There we see Disenchant on that Mox. I think that's a pretty good decision. You kind of want to slow him down a little bit. And maybe, you know, Jordy has a Suchi or a Sarah Angel that he could play next turn. Let's see what Avert can do here. And okay, the screen is not really working with us here. 
but he is playing a demonic tutor. Okay, we're back it seems. So played a Savannah and then uh, tapped his lands to play a demonic tutor. Interesting, right? What is he going to choose? That is the question. Usually you would just go for Ancestral Recall. You don't really have to think about it. And uh, you're already asking about the amount of cards in hand of Avert. I, I believe it's six. It went pretty quick. It was hard for me to see. Now he's got five in hand, but we don't see, or five, I mean five mana available, but we don't see a Sarah Angel in hand for Yordi. Unfortunately for him, that would have been a great play. There we see a Mishra's Factory. And let's see, what is he going to do? He's a little bit in the tank here, and I really wonder what Cardi looked up with that Demonic Tutor. And he is passing turn. Interesting. There we see basic planes a pass as well. So I guess there are just a lot of answers in the hand of Jordy. Maybe some sorts to plowshares, for example. Maybe some disenchants. And this must be going through Avert's mind as well, thinking, okay, if I attack with my factories, he's very likely to destroy it. And then I'm a land down. Do I really want that? Because he's got, you know, he's got four lands. It's not that much. Okay, there's a Mox Jet, so he's got five. Are we gonna see a Sarah from his side of the table? Going through his hand again. He's really in the tank here. Of course, this is a deciding game. The winner of this game will advance to the semifinals of the Urborg Force Frenzy. And there we see a pass turn here. Does he already want to do something in end step? Perhaps thinking about playing a disenchant on the Mox Jet, knowing that five mana is kind of this Sarah Angel time, exactly. So that's probably why he's playing the disenchant here. And what we see, by the way, is that um, is that Avert only has one blue source. So perhaps he's got a Brain Geyser in hand as well, who knows. What is he going to do here? Looks like he's got a lot of cards in hand there. Tapping two and just disenchanting the Fowler Stone here. Probably just because he doesn't want to discard anything. So I really wonder what's in his hand. A Mishra's Workshop. Interesting to see there are just not a lot of creatures here. And there we see a Larby of Alexandria. And he's... Can he use it? Does he have seven in hand? I mean, it looks like a really full hand to me. And he's just passing turns. He probably wants to use his low on the end step of Yordi here. Play a Plains. We don't see any creatures. Okay, there is a Mind Twist. He's going to draw. Does he have a counter spell? Actually, he doesn't have double blue. So this is a brilliant Mind Twist here by Jordi. Is this actually going to give him the, the victory? So it's the Mind Twist for six. So he gets to keep two cards. Wow, 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 wow. And look at, there was a counter spell in there, but he just didn't have the double blue. And this is going to be tough now. At least he can attack, I guess, for four, which is not too bad. I mean, I don't know what's in his hand, obviously, but it might be worth it just to attack for four here. Okay, there was a little glitch. It looks like we're just, we're back at the start again. So he's thinking, okay. What is he going to do? And yeah, he's going to attack for four here. And play as a Vanna line. So he's got some pressure on the board and, you know, Yordi's on 15. What does he have? I believe I saw an Icy Manipulator there as well. Ooh, Time Walk. That is pretty sweet. Then I guess he doesn't have an IC or else he would have played Icy Time Walk or whatever. Um, there's a Suchi. Oh, I think is that a copy artifact and a Swords. That's not too shabby. Copy artifact on Suchi. This is a really good turn here for Yordi. Putting pressure on the board and having blockers. That's quite important. And there we see Volcanic Island. And it looks like it's just going to be a pass here. 
Ooh, an attack by the lion. That is interesting. Does that mean he's got a bolt in hand? He's actually taking the damage because I think it means he's got a bolt. Then again, it's not too bad of a trade if you're Jordy, right? You can decide, okay, I'm just going to trade one Suchi for a lion and a bolt. It's not too bad. And balance there. Oh, of course. Of course. I didn't see the balance coming. That's why he did it. So this was actually a very good decision by Jordy here. Not to block. Take the damage instead. Or else he would have lost both of his creatures. And he's actually going to sort his own creature. Yeah, that makes sense in this scenario. Because that, that's going to give him four life. And because of the balance, he would lose it anyway. He also loses a land. Wow, what an interesting game number three here. And it's really like kind of stuck. We see Yordi on 17. There's a disintegrate. Ooh, this is important because now he can start swinging in. So he can hurt him for four here. I mean, he's still on 13. He's got time, but he's got to do something. Oh, this is good. Triskelion, he can kill the Savannah Lion whenever he wants to. Oh man, this strike is coming at the right time. Oh, a swords. A swords. So he's probably going to kill the lion, right? And then he's going to, yeah, is he going to take the life? He's actually not. So he's going to kill itself. So he's, he can still use the anime dead later in the game. It does mean he doesn't gain the life. And he takes four damage. Going to drop to nine. And pass turn here. And is that another? It's hard to see with the glare. It's another factory, so he can deal five damage. Those factories are killing Yordi right now. He needs Armageddon. Does he have an Armageddon in the deck? There's a Sarah Angel, but it's not going to help him, though. Does he have something else? Five mana. I mean, he needs like. Ah, uh, he needs a bolt. Okay, okay, okay. He's passing turn. Does that mean he's got a disenchant or something? I mean, that 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 Black Lotus gives him some options. And yeah, he's just going for it. Attacking with three two twos. And that's it. He's got the game. Oh, <laughs> he read Elemental Blast. And you just got to love the, the friendship between these two players. They're really cool guys. They're very relaxed. The whole atmosphere in Dusseldorf was very, very laid back. And... I mean, these are the games, these are the matches that you want to see. And I absolutely loved seeing this top eight match. Looking forward to see more of Avert's deck in the semi-finals here. And talking about the semi-finals, uh, if you'd like to um, see more of this tournament, um, you know, keep an eye on the channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe, hit that notification bell, because then you get a message every time I post a new video. And I will be posting the semi-finals and the finals of this great event right here on Timmy Talk. So if you want to stay up to date, if you want to see if Averitt can defend his title and, uh, and, and win once again the Urborg Forest Frenzy, keep an eye on this channel. Um, talking about all that, um, if you want to support me, if you like the content that I make, you can support Timmy Talks already starting from $1 by becoming a patron. So how does that work? It's quite easy. There's probably an info card popping up right now. Click on the info card that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And uh, there you can find out how you can support me and support what I'm doing. The cool thing is, if you join the Timmy Talks Patreon program, we've got a Discord, we've got a really nice community going, uh, we've got tournaments, and of course, uh, we've got an end scroll, and I can put your name in it. So just become a patron, and your name will be added to the end scroll. Talking about that, let's take a look at the fantastic, the wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's take a look at the end scroll.
Petrus, think it is Sumba Kazi. 